what I'm doing is putting this together to try to quickly and simply convey to somebody who does has never heard or knows anything even at all about catastrophism or diluvialism or any of that, which is the vast majority, about 99.999% of the human population has not a clue that we actually live on a planet that is periodically undergoes global catastrophes. And the second thing they don't realize is that what we now know about the timing and tempo of these global catastrophes and the intervals between successive catastrophes is this. As we look at the last quarter million years, and this is a fact that you should really, really ingrain into your consciousness, is this. In the last quarter million years, the longest interval between catastrophes is the one we're in now. <clears throat> we have gone, we're now in a record. We've set a record for having gone 10,000 years without a global catastrophe of the scale that we're seeing here. Well, actually, if it turns out that the Burkle crater that we've talked about in here is authentic, which it certainly suggests that it was, then we actually had a global catastrophe 6,000 years ago. However, it wasn't as severe as this one. And what do we use as the barometer for severity of catastrophes? Loss of life. Loss of life, exactly, Dolores, exactly. So when this event happened, there was a major species loss all over the planet, with a few very significant exceptions, one of those exceptions being sub-Saharan Africa. Now, when, you go, when one goes in, like to early, the work of early anthropologists, early part of the 20th century, where anthropologists are collecting tales, and there was a number of them, for example, that were interested in um, the unity of ancient mythic traditions. And so they collected tales, for example, um, the belief in giants. Many, many, you know, <coughs> indigenous peoples have tales about giants. Also many traditions have belief uh, that human beings once had a longer lifespan. But of all of the traditions and their universality, the most prevalent one found amongst the greatest majority of cultures the world over is that of a great flood. I mean, far and away, that's the one that is most consistently reported in a whole variety of ancient traditions, the great flood. So what we've got here is that there was what you're looking at right here is graphic evidence of a great flood. Now, the point that I keep trying to make here is that academic, the main, academic mainstream has contrived a theory for this that keeps its significance limited to a strictly local or regional event. And what I'm saying, and have been for 20 years, is that no, this is actually evidence of a global catastrophe that, sh that manifested its effects regionally and the way it manifested its effects in the southern Appalachians wasn't the same as it manifested its effects in Pacific Northwest or how it manifested its effects you know in the Mediterranean or in South America or in in Europe or any other place but the catastrophe was pretty much global in scale and it had varying degrees of severity depending on geographic location North America and South America were the most severely affected by the last great global catastrophe, as would be evidenced by the sheer number of species lost. And South America actually, in my latest research, I've discovered that now the census is that South America actually lost more mega mammals than North America. More <laughs> mega mammals. So, well, there, yes? There wasn't ice down there. There was not ice down there. No, there wasn't. Not so what it, whatever triggered the catastrophe, it was able to cause a mass extermination in South America, but it also apparently was able to trigger the melting of the ice. Because, see, that is one of the unexplained mysteries of science currently, is where the energy source to melt the ice it melted too fast. That's the problem. I, we've talked about that repeatedly in here, the energy paradox. Okay, so at the end of the last ice age, the planet lost half of its great mammals. Half. That was a significant loss. Okay, you've seen this. I'm going to go real quick. High water mark, pretty obvious, right? 
strand lines, see the faint horizontal lines left over from the water draining away, just like we see on the mountainsides out in western United States. Can you see them? Yeah. They're visible, right? <clears throat> you see them, don't you, Whit? I see them on you the white. Okay, how about this one? Which way was current flow? Right to left. Yes. Now, if, before I move on, I want you to ponder, now what kind of a current flow are we talking about here? <laughs> Big one right there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're probably talking about a current flow that's several hundred feet deep. We're probably talking about a peak discharge that's the size of a, of a major river passing through this valley, and this is up in the Smokies. This is by Big Creek, which is up in the Smoky Mountain National Park. And if you hike over the Smokies and get off away from the roadways, you'll see stuff like this all over the darn place. And once you, for example, know what imbrication is, you know, your average uninformed person will walk up here and go by this and maybe be impressed by the size of these rocks, but have no clue as to what it's really the story they're telling. See, but what this is, this is, a, this is telling a story about unimaginably large-scale floods passing through these mountain hollows. Ah, here we go, beautiful example of scale and variance. Look at there, you see the delta fan? Right there? Looks just like the Nile River, doesn't it? If you look at air NASA photographs of the mouth of the Nile, it looks just like this. In fact, what we see is multiple delta fans here splay, splaying out, splaying out. Because see, what we had here was a, we had a major sandbar formed by a flood, and then residual flood waters cut this secondary channel into the newly created uh, sandbar and then built these beautiful little deltas. Look at this. <clears throat> Notice this newly eroded cliff face right here. Okay, every one of these features we're going to see on a large scale. <clears throat> Do you see shorelines mm -hmm. from this dried up lake? Mm -hmm. um, You can read this here. Now, if you look, this is a this is a really beautiful example of scale and variance. Notice you've got this small little creek. On the outside of the bend, it's got a steeper bank, and on the inside of the bend, it's building this little sandbar. Well, when you look at the big picture, you see here's the outside of a bend. Here's the, here's the sandbar, the opposite side is cut steep. So what you're seeing here is, is you're just seeing if you take this and just size it up, there's an example of scale and variance. Water really has this property in that it can erode stuff on a small scale that's identical in shape and form to what it does on a large scale. So if you want to learn how to read the effects of these giant catastrophic floods, Start by just going out by our local creeks after it rains and studying what you see. Now you see here how it's steep on this side and it's building a sandbar on this side. Now interestingly, what you have here is a remnant. See this, this is the equivalent of a floodplain. Now the ancient giant floods, this whole area for about a mile wide is a giant floodplain <clears throat> that was left over when this whole thing was like a river moving through here. And then as the river drained away, it left this flat flood plain, and the modern creek has cut down this little channel in it where it's been flowing for, say, the last 10,000 years. Oblique ripples along the flank of a stream-cut channel in a gravel bar. You see those ripples? How they're actually on the side of this slope here? Now, you can find that exact thing duplicated right here, but on a much larger scale. This is Washington State. This is um, um, McNeil Canyon. McNeil, yeah. 
Remember that? It was, that, that whole canyon was incredible. Okay, how about this canyon? Now oh, notice man. here, Ooh. scale and variance. Mm -hmm. Here you have the little channel cut in the freshly made sandbar. And here you have the catastrophic flood channel. This is in southern Idaho. This is near the Snake River. Oh. In fact, this oh, right up just off the slide is the Snake River Canyon up here. And this thing opens into it. Mallet Gorge. Mallet Gorge. Well, Mallet I gotta, Gorge. I gotta look at that on the satellite map. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, that's incredible.